franchise tag day. Yay! If you ever wondered <laughs> how little NFL teams value running backs, look at this year's free agent class. Saquon Barkley can go wherever he wants to go. Did even get franchise tagged by the G-Men. All-purpose superstar Austin Eckler. He's been trying to get a better deal. Looks like he's going to be on his way out with the Chargers. Derrick Henry with the Titans. They're going to part ways. You have Josh Jacobs with the Raiders. They failed to agree on an extension. DeAndre Swift in the Eagles. They part ways as well. And uh, NFL teams have little interest in committing money to uh, veteran running backs with heavy mileage on the tread. And uh, the free agent class, you've got some proven uh, players here. Uh, you look at the draft, I don't think there's a running back that has been mentioned at all for the first round here. And it used to be, you know, you wanted to be a running back. Then it became you wanted to be a quarterback. But it used to be in the day, running backs were the stars. You had to have a great running back. And growing up in Ohio, Jim Brown, I got to see him play, not in person, but I got to see him on TV. The Browns games were always on. And you got to see one of the greats of all time. And, you know, their quarterback was just okay. Frank Ryan. You know, nothing special, but Jim Brown was really special. Even with O.J. Simpson in Buffalo. You probably don't remember the quarterback. I believe Joe Ferguson was the quarterback for the Buffalo Bills. Uh, Eric Dickerson. Like, you remember these running backs. You may not remember the quarterbacks, but that's not the case anymore. And they tried to sort of unionize or do something last year. Austin Eckler and a group of them were like, wait, let's kind of form this coalition. Let's have a meeting here and let's see if we can all get together and see if we can be compensated. It's just not going to happen. You know, Christian McCaffrey may be the last of his kind in a variety of ways, but certainly the contract that he signed when he went from Carolina to San Francisco. Uh you know, Kamara got a similar deal, I think, with uh, the Saints, but he has never lived up to that contract. McCaffrey led the league in rushing. I just don't know if you're looking at a running back saying, I'm going to give you the ball 25 times. Like, we, we don't need you. We, we have to have you. We don't necessarily need – we're not dependent upon you. And it used to be you started with your running back. Your running back set up everything. If you could run the ball, controlled the clock – then your quarterback got play action. Now, all of a sudden, that's your formula for success. Now it's different. Your running back has to be able to block, catch some passes. And oh, by the way, can you run the ball 10 to 15 times a game? That's it. You don't need to spend a lot of money. It's almost like the running back is like a place kicker or a punter. Hey, we got to have you. We're not going to spend a lot of money on you because you know what? You're interchangeable. There's probably 15 running backs who will be taken after the third round who might have the opportunity to stick with the team. Just like Tony Pollard did with the Cowboys, where you went, you don't need Zeke, you got Pollard. Well, now you got Pollard, fourth round pick, you don't need him because there's another Tony Pollard there. And I feel bad for the position because of what it's meant to the game. Go down through history, and it was about running backs. I don't know who Red Grange's quarterback was, but I know who Red Grange was. And then every decade, it felt like there were running backs that you remembered. Marion Motley. Like, there are just so many of them. Now, it's like, oh, they got a couple of interchangeable running backs, but you got that great coach. Isaiah Pacheco. <laughs> you got Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> He's not going to get paid. Isaiah Pacheco will not get paid. He's going to run really, really hard for the next couple of years. Then all of a sudden he's going to go, hey, I won a couple of Super Bowls. I, I ran really, really hard. And it's like, yeah, thanks. Thanks. We've got some nice parting gifts for you. All righty. Seaton, what's the uh, poll question we're going to start out with? It's just the worst, huh? Yeah, it is. It's it just is. the worst. Yeah, yeah. Jeepers creepers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Paul sent this one over. Uh, which has been more devalued over the years? Mm -hmm. The low post center or a running back? Mm. So not a guy who can go down low and post up. It's the guy who goes down on the blocks. That's where he belongs. Hey, get down on the blocks. It's that, not even a position anymore. No, it's not. It's not even in the game. Like Running backs are still used to their detriment. Uh, I, they're just not valued. I would say the low post guy because 
It's non-existent. And you don't even need a low post guy. No. You need to have a running back. You have to have somebody at least in the position. You don't necessarily have to have a great one. And it helps if you have a couple of them. But I would say the low post guy. You know, we've That's all but been uh, shoveled out of the game where you're going, man, remember a big guy? Mm. And, and we do wonder about this. What would the game be like for Shaq now? Or Kareem now? Akeem Olajuwon now? David Robinson now? How would they play? Robert Parrish, would they be perimeter? Yes, Mark. You may have to take Akeem out of that because Akeem could get busy facing up towards the basket. He so could I... give you a 15, foul line extended jumper. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, you're right. Um, but some of the other players, they were basically low post. Is Kareem a three-point threat now? Would David Robinson, who didn't have a great shot, be a three-point threat? Shaq, what would you do with Shaq? I still think there's a way to counteract everything that's going on in the NBA. Now, I've been told by those in the NBA, those who follow the NBA, the logic is flawed because it's still about we can get a three while you're getting a two. And I said, well, you can attempt a three. I can guarantee a two. If you put Shaq on the low block, I'm getting a two. If you're going to shoot threes, you're at least attempting to get a three. But they say my logic is flawed. I, I always go back to the Cardinals of the mid-80s with Whitey Herzog. They just had more speed than anybody. Vince Coleman was on that team. They just ran. They played differently, played differently in their ballpark. They ended up winning a World Series. But with the big man now, could you see a team where they go, we got two big guys on the low blocks, and let's see if you can deal with them. Like I always wonder, does somebody go counterintuitive and say, Here's our game plan. You stop us. Yes, Eaton. Yeah, like for every three you miss, we're going to get four by, you know, kicking it down low. Yes, yes. I mean, that's my logic here. Yeah. But I'm, I, you know, I've been watching the game long enough to know styles change. The game changes. Could you do something that disrupts? You know, somebody's going to get back to just running the football. I've said that because now your defenses, they're built on speed. They're not built on power. Now do you have a power offense that you have to deal with us now instead of us kind of falling in line with everybody else? Because if I'm trying to be better than Patrick Mahomes, I'm not going to be. I don't have anybody who's going to be better than him. Can we be better than the Kansas City Chiefs? That would be my approach. Yes, Marv? To your point about the Cardinals of the 80s, I think the speedy leadoff man – has gone the same way of the center yeah. and the uh, the running back. Yes. Where they were big time. Like Ricky Henderson was maybe the biggest star in baseball at one point. And now, like a leadoff guy, you just don't need him. Well, now you're looking at your leadoff guy for hitting home runs. And it used to be nobody disrupted the game the way Ricky did. I mean, he messed with everybody. And I keep wondering, why wouldn't you still want to do that? And I know it's built on hitting home runs, but I would want to be – counteractive and go, you know what? We're going to do it this way. And maybe you, I would have a park that was spacious. I would have a pitcher's park and we're going to beat you with speed. You come into our place, you're not going to be able to rely on home runs. If I'm the Oakland A's in my new state, by the way, do you see the what are you going to be the Mets? <laughs> oh, that sounds, I'm sorry. Well, no, no offense, Dan, they, but that, that is a terrible plan. <laughs> well, they brought the fences in. Yeah. They, you know. yeah, because it's too big. Yeah, but they didn't, they didn't build a roster that said, uh, hey, we're going to take idea. advantage of this cavernous ballpark. That's a terrible idea. Did you see the, uh, the Oakland A's, <laughs> the uh, new stadium renderings That's in something. Vegas? Just need to find a home for it and some land, apparently. Yeah. yeah. And maybe if some it was money. Be in Vegas, this is what it would be look like if they wanted us here anymore, but they don't. So. It'd be like a glorified snow globe is what it kind of looks like. You know, when, when your kids blow a bubble and it lands on the ground and stays there for a second before it pops, it looks like that. Because it's not completely covered. It's not a dome. It's an indoor-outdoor. If it doesn't do the same thing as the sphere that's oh. there where you can show it, <laughs> it's a baseball, that's thing that, and then that, it's worthless. That would be great. <laughs> that would be great. Having been in the sphere in Vegas, it was pretty impressive. I don't know if it's, you know, financially sound. Like that was your jumbotron where you yes. could sit. The game was going on down there, but you leaned back and watched the whole game on that big <laughs> sphere. <laughs> yeah, they weren't supposed to uh, 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 release that, but somebody released it a day early and everybody was like, wait, is this? Have you seen the uh, Sydney, Australia Opera House? Famous? Sure. sure. 
So it looks like a combo of the Opera House and maybe a snow globe. And it's going to seat 33,000, which I love. I love when you have a true home field. Well, I don't know if they're going to have home field. advantage. It's going to be quaint. Like when you go to Boston, when you go to Fenway, the seats are terrible, but the atmosphere is spectacular, and it feels like a home field advantage because it's not 50,000 or 60,000. You go to Yankee Stadium, plenty of seats still available. But when you have these places that are smaller, you know, like Cameron Indoor, I mean, it, that's a home court advantage. I, I love those friendly confines. I don't know how I got off on this tangent, but I did, as you've come to expect here. But uh, the, the plight of running backs here, it's uh, not going to change anytime soon. But I wonder if an offensive coordinator will change philosophy at some point. I wonder if an NBA head coach will change philosophy. It's just like you go back to Paul Westhead when he was at Loyola Marymount. And he said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to swap your twos for our threes, and we're going to run the entire game. And now look at what the NBA is. It's basically that. By the way, I don't know if he gets into the Hall of Fame. When you think about contributions to the game, what Paul did, and I did win a title with the Lakers. I think he, he took over for uh, Jack McKinney, who was hurt in a bicycle accident. He took over, but then I think there was sort of some unrest with the Lakers' magic, and Paul Westhead didn't get along. But what Paul did with Loyola Marymount, I don't know if he's been considered for the Basketball Hall of Fame, but really one of those innovative guys. But that's what I keep wondering. You know, innovation. What is the next? What is the next for baseball? What is the next for football? What is the next for basketball? And I wondered about that, you know, with the running backs, and then you start to think about, there's got to be a shack out there again, doesn't there? And then what happens to a guy who's seven feet, 300 pounds? He's not going to be on the perimeter. Yeah, Paulie. I'm looking at the NBA mock drafts, and there's only two real true back-to-the-basket centers in this draft. Zach Eady of Purdue, and I have him going in the second round, just like last year, which is why I went back to college. And Donovan Klingen, Klingen the big man for um, UConn, he is not a three-point shooter. And neither, you, it's hard to get drafted if you're not shooting threes at whatever height you're at. Yeah, and that's the game. But what do you do? What do you do if you have somebody? Like, I still, I don't know what you would do if Shaq came out of college right now. How are you going to play him? He, he would be developed differently and he wouldn't be Shaq. But he can't shoot. I can't develop that because he doesn't have a shot. See, I, I disagree. I think at, at age 15, they would bring him outside he can't, he, he can't shoot. He never improved shooting to be able to shoot long range. Now, he, he could handle the ball, but he couldn't shoot. There are certain guys who just can't shoot, and Shaq couldn't shoot. And I can't have him on the perimeter. That's why I don't know what you would do with that position if I had somebody of you know that size, that potential greatness. Yeah, Mark. To Paulie's point, uh, Shaq's parents would hire lethal shooter, a guy that's a, uh, a big time shooting coach. They would hire him and he would spend the next 365 days working on his jumper. Like everybody else does now. Like everybody who's in NBA. And not everybody can shoot. Everyone thinks they can shoot. That's the problem. <laughs> like Zach Eady, he's been growing up in this generation. He can't shoot. He's just the biggest guy in college basketball. It's not like you go, all right, you're going to the NBA. Now you got to shoot the three. He's been big all of his life. He's wanted to play in the NBA all of his life. Now, is he any better this year than he was last year at shooting? Yes, Eaton. Okay. The movie is called Lethal Shooter, right? It stars Liam Neeson, and he plays <laughs> a hot shooting basketball superstar who also is like a spy and secret agent on mm, the side. I will and he's find you. Lethal shooter. I'll fix your jump shot. Uh, <laughs> That's the movie. Liam Neeson. Lethal, lethal shooter. shooter. Two. In yeah. a world. Starts Friday. Theater near you. Yes. Lethal. But he's too old to be lethal shooter. Well, that's Maybe he, and it's like him and his, uh, like a, a kid from the neighborhood or something. Mm, lethal him and his son. shooter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The only way to stop him is with a handgun. And league rules And international that. law prohibits that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I still love that that article, that line is that, uh, you know, the only way to stop him is with a handgun. 
league rules frown upon that. <laughs> like, like, Not in the bylaws. That's great. That's that's the environment I grew up in. Like league rules frowned upon you using a handgun to stop me. <laughs> that's great. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, you know what's a fascinating <laughs> case, fascinating case study is Brooke Lopez came out of college. Yep. was a defender, a post guy. You know, the decent rebounder, decent scorer in the post. Never shot threes. He shot 10 threes in his first eight seasons. Total. 10 three-point attempts. And then guess what? The year after Steph Curry broke out, the next year he's shooting five threes a game and becomes one of the premier outside shooting big men in the sport. He's tripled his salary. We goaded him into taking a three in the All-Star game. Yeah. Remember we said, hey, and I don't know how many years ago it was, but we said to him, hey, would you take a three? And he didn't take any threes. And he took a three in the All-Star game. The next thing we know, it's like, man, Brooke Lopez shooting some threes. Yes, Eden. This guy on Twitter here, James, just said, uh, Michigan football is a prime example of what you were just talking about. Yeah. Run the ball and huddle. Teams couldn't handle it. Smash football. Saban's teams just couldn't. Yeah. People weren't ready to get punched in the mouth like that again. I, I just. Counterintuitive. Yes, you know? absolutely. 